welcome. Thank you for coming along. It's nice to be here again with the SPR. Um, rather like these conferences. Uh, somebody did ask, seeing as it's Friday evening, uh, is, is it going to be a practical? And am I going to kind of distribute anything? I'm afraid you can all leave if you are disappointed, but it, it's going to be a lecture, I'm afraid. So uh, I did actually, I've been doing a lot of public lectures recently, and uh, on one of them, it said a uh, free lecture on psychedelics and we had about 600 people turn up queuing down the street. They just read free psychedelics and there was this <laughs> they had to turn two thirds of them away. Um, but no, it's not practical, I'm just going to talk. So tonight I'm going to be talking to you about psychedelomancy, uh, precognition with psychedelics. So as you all know, the mantic arts are those uh, traditions in which people see into the future, divination and so on and so forth, bibliomancy or uh, infantomancy or whatever it might be. Um, and this is psychedelomancy. So the ancient art, perhaps, of uh, divining the future with uh, psychoactive plants and in some cases, psychoactive animals. But I'm not gonna talk about animals, I'm gonna just talk to you about plants and people. <clears throat> the people I'm kind of primarily interested in are people we might call shamans. Uh, so shaman is a, a, just a word from the Tungus tribe in Siberia, but it's been used by anthropologists and academics the world over to apply to practitioners of a certain magico-spiritual practice, which we might call shamanism. It has kind of common features, and those common features are typically that people go into an altered state of consciousness uh, at will in the name of their community to bring back useful information from uh, across time and space. So they transcend time and space through an altered state and often also involves the, the communication with spirits of nature. Um, so this transcendence of time and space and the altered states that they use uh, could take many different forms. Typically in shamanic practices, drumming is the, the favored technique. Um, most Practitioners of shamanism use drums, but he, as Stanley Krippner also said, you know, the five Ds. It could be dancing, drumming, diet, dreaming, which is also very common because it's a freebie, or indeed drugs, uh, or death even, but that's a bit of a one-way street, but it does begin with D. Um, so uh, my research is primarily focused on the use of drugs, although they're not necessarily drugs as we may define them. Uh, and we find the use of these uh, substances from indigenous tribes the world over on every continent uh, of the planet. So for instance, uh, in Mexico here, you see the Wiradica, also known as the Huicholis, making use of peyote cactus, which contains mescaline. Also in Mexico, we see the use of uh, this mushroom, psilocybe mushroom, from the Mixtec and the Maztec, the use of Amanita muscaria mushroom, the red and white spotted one, uh, from uh, Siberia and North America, some of this may be familiar to some of you. I gave a very similar talk about this in 2012. The use of uh, perhaps the Chura in India, or Pachuri in Australia, or Iboga in Africa, or indeed Syrian Roo in well, Syria, I, I presume, but also uh, the Middle East, as well as the Amazon, where we see the use of ayahuasca and a number of uh, quite a veritable cornucopia of different psychoactive plants. So we think shamans have been doing these practices for a very long time, thousands of years. There's archaeological evidence from Mexico of the use of peyote cactus uh, in the region where they still use it, going back at least five and a half thousand years. So this is a, a very ancient practice, we presume. Whereas in the, the West, let's call it, within the academy, uh, the use of these substances goes back about a hundred years. Uh, I was at a conference in Basel in Switzerland this year celebrating 75 years since the discovery of LSD by this man, Albert Hoffman, who's a Swiss chemist you may be familiar with. A very good advert for LSD, in fact, because he lived to 102 years old and was very lucid right up until his death. He even gave a, a, a keynote lecture at a conference in his honour, aged 100 years old. Um, so Albert had an accidental discovery of LSD working in his laboratory one day. He said that he had a peculiar presentiment because he'd already synthesized the drug some years earlier 
um, but he was drawn back to it. He said that LSD spoke to him and uh, he went back into his lab against protocol, resynthesized the LSD five years later and accidentally somehow ingested it and had the first ever LSD experience. Um, he also had perhaps the first LSD induced paranormal like experience which was he had an out of body uh, sensation. He felt like he was up on the ceiling, looking down at his body. He thought it died and was rather terrified by that. And so effectively had some kind of near death like experience. Um, that was in 1943. Some years later, by 1950, this man here, Humphrey Osmond, uh, was uh, working with his colleague, John Smithies, who's been associated with the SBR for his entire career. He's still alive and working in his 90s, in fact. Uh, so John Smithies and Humphrey Osmond together started doing research with mescaline initially and then later LSD. And um, Humphrey Osmond was in communication with this man, Aldous Huxley, and together they coined the phrase, or the, the, the term psychedelic, which means mind manifesting that these things are kind of non-specific psychic amplifiers. They'll just turn up the volume on whatever psychic material is available in the, in the conscious and unconscious mind at the time. Um, uh, both of them believe that the psychedelics could give them access to psychical states of consciousness, to be able to transcend space and time and bring back useful information. And Humphrey Osmond, in fact, actually did do some rudimentary telepathy experiments on LSD uh, with him, with his colleague, uh, Duncan Blewett, and uh, their assistant, they, they stopped the experiment because their assistant got freaked out because they were, their, their results were so accurate. Um, so between them, they came up with this term psychedelic, and of course, Aldous Huxley uh, had uh, very much been interested in this kind of perennial philosophy. He'd taken a lot of his ideas from uh, one of Rupert's famous, uh, favorite philosophers, Henri Bergson, um, who had this notion that the brain didn't so much produce consciousness as it was a, a filter of consciousness, that your brain could tune into consciousness, but that it essentially filters it to stop us being overwhelmed with uh, the experience of the entire universe uh, simultaneously. And of course, Aldous Huxley then applied psychedelics to this idea and said that psychedelics were the agents which could turn off the filter of consciousness, uh, what he called the reducing valve function of the brain, allowing uh, man to access mind at large, i.e. consciousness with a big C, as Bernard calls it. Uh, so these rudimentary ideas, we find that the very first discoverers and explorers of psychedelics all had their own parapsychological or psychical leanings and experiences. It's quite curious, and I said earlier on in our panel, that um, Huxley's ideas were never really kind of formalized or put to the test. But curiously, in 2012, when my colleagues at Imperial College, Robin Carhart Harris and his team, did some of the very first brain imaging with people on psychedelics, uh, they they were rather surprised at what they'd found. And if you'd asked any neuroscientist worth their fantastic neuroimaging grants, what happens in the human brain when you give somebody a psychedelic, uh, your neuroscientist would say, oh, there'll be an increase in activity in this part of the brain or increase in activity in that part of the brain. They all have their own favorite parts of the brain. Um, but what they actually found was quite surprised. There was no increase in activity anywhere, but there were decreases in this key region of the brain called the default mode network. And so Robin himself said, seeing a decrease was surprising. We thought profound experience equaled more activity. So that if you're having a, an intense, overloaded sensorium uh, of experience from your psychedelics, you would expect that there would be uh, corresponding increases in activity. Uh, actually, Robin, I tipped off Robin to, to Huxley's notions about the brain as filter and the reducing valve, which he wasn't actually aware of, and that later appeared in some of his later papers with Dave Nutt. Um, so it's curious to know that also, this is, uh, they did this research with psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. <clears throat> and magic mushrooms of this variety of the, the psilocybin uh, genus weren't known to be uh, psychedelic until 1953. 
uh, when this couple here, the Wassons, um, were amateur mycologists, they'd uh, had a tip-off from Robert Graves, the English poet and playwright, that there was a mushroom cult in Mexico which made use of these mushrooms in their uh, spiritual practices. They went down to Mexico, several days donkey ride uh, up a mountain to see the Maztec Indians, and they encountered this man, Don Arulio. And Don Arulio uh, performed a ceremony for them where he took some mushrooms, and he then told the Wassons from the States two things about their son back home in, in, in America that, uh, that even they didn't know about. But when they got back to New York, they found out to be true. One of them hadn't actually happened yet, but uh, did later happen. So this man, a several days donkey ride up an obscure mountain in Mexico, was able to tell them two things which turned out to be accurate under the influence of these mushrooms. And that's the first encounter of, of the West, so-called, with uh, the use of psilocybin uh, psychedelic mushrooms. Now, the Wassons wanted to know what the active principles of these uh, mushrooms were, so they uh, sent off samples to various pharmacological uh, companies, uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, companies, and uh, they did analysis on, on the mushrooms of the various alkaloids, but they fed them to lab animals, and of course, animals don't tell you very much about when they're tripping, so yeah. they, were, they found it very difficult to identify what the active alkaloids were, and some ended up in the lab of, of this man, Albert Hoffman, who had years earlier, 10 years earlier, uh, discovered uh, LSD. And he did the sensible thing. He did a simple uh, chromatography paper separation of the alkaloids. He tore the paper into strips and he fed the different alkaloids to his human lab assistants and, of course, took some himself as well. And uh, by this method, he was able to identify the two active uh, components, uh, which he called psilocin and psilocybin, spelled with a PSI. I think the relationship to psi uh, was probably accidental. Uh, based on the, the genus from which they come from. Nevertheless, he took a precaution, having had a somewhat terrifying near-death experience 10 years earlier with LSD, he had a medical doctor with him um, in case he had a hairy experience, um, but it didn't really help because when he was under the influence of the psilocybin, the doctor came to him with his stethoscope to uh, take his pulse, uh, but he, he saw the doctor as an Aztec priest resplendent with feathered headdress and his uh, stethoscope had turned into an obsidian knife and it was coming to cut out his beating heart which rather terrified him again as you can imagine <clears throat> um, the curious thing about that is he wasn't the only person to have that kind of experience because he then proceeded to give his uh, psilocybin mushrooms and his synthesized psilocybin that he had made in the laboratory to his colleagues in Switzerland and even if they didn't know the provenance of the, the mushrooms, they would often have uh, Mexican-like experiences of uh, Aztec uh, art, Aztec temples or Mayan art and Mayan temples. And he was astonished at this, that they didn't even know they'd come from Mexico. He actually ended up at a parapsychology conference in the, in the 60s, in the early 60s, uh, and uh, spoke about this, and he suggested that uh, the people under the influence of psilocybin were somehow tuning in to the consciousness of the original users of these substances, uh, a bit like kind of psychometry, if you like. Um, <clears throat> although, on the other hand, Gordon Wasson, who discovered the psilocybin mushrooms, said, somewhat in a chicken and egg fashion, that actually the, the Aztec temples and the Mayan artwork and temples was actually inspired by their use of psilocybin. So it was like, you know, which came first? the art and the temples or the psilocybin. Nevertheless, Albert Hoffman did come and, you know, give some commentary on this uh, extraordinary experience. And uh, he later synthesized the, 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 the psilocybin and, and took it back to some of the shamans in Mexico, such as Maria Sabina here, the famous Mexican shamaness. And she took the, the synthetic psilocybin and said, yes, this is, these are my little children, as she called her psilocybin spirits. So it was good enough for the indigenous people. So we find that all the earliest discoverers uh, and explorers, if it had their encounters with, with psychedelics, had 
uh, parapsychological like phenomena occurring on their very first encounter. Uh, they didn't stay with the explorers for long. They started being used by uh, psychiatrists such as Stanislav Grof, one of the founders of transpersonal psychology, um, <coughs> who'd spent uh, many years conducting some of the first psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. He wrote a great book, LSD Psychotherapy. Uh, he conducted over 4,000 such sessions over a 20 year period. And he said uh, he observed patients experiencing past life recall, out of body experiences, ESP, particularly precognition, which is good for us, accurate remote viewing and space time travel on a daily basis. So this is a kind of occupational hazard of uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapists. Um, he, however, he wasn't so naive to, to know that some of these experiences could just be delusion or very subjective. Uh, but he's, he, he very much acknowledged there was the possibility of sensory leakage and so on and so forth. But he still said that some of the experiences that he encountered were, were so extraordinary, they, they could only have a, a parapsychological explanation. These substances didn't stay in the therapy rooms for long, though, however. They started being used uh, recreationally by people like uh, Danny the Dealer here. Uh, and um, with this famous Camberwell carrot. Uh, and there are a number of surveys that have been conducted with so-called recreational users of psychedelics, um, such as one conducted by Charles Tart. It's actually done in the 1970s in California. Um, and uh, his participants reported a very high degree or high, very high prevalence of uh, telepathic uh, and other psi-like experiences under the influence of the cannabis, as much as 83% of his sample reported having telepathy experiences whilst they were high. Um, now you could say, well, you know, this is just California in the 1970s and the people who are attracted to smoking cannabis are also the kind of people who are gonna have lots of these kinds of experiences anyway. Um, but we find mm -hmm. other surveys such as one from Delgren uh, found that, found similar prevalence figures uh, about 60% in their case of psychedelic use, but also that the more psychedelics people took, the more of these experiences they had. So there seems to be a direct relationship between the consumption and the experience. Um, I actually conducted my own research on this as well, of course. I conducted a survey uh, with uh, Marius Katenis back in 2005. And we looked at all kinds of different drugs and we looked at a variety of different experiences. Uh, and of course, we found the same thing, that those people under the influence of psychedelics in particular would often report telepathy, about half of our sample. Unfortunately, precognition uh, was less common, uh, only about 21%, and psychokinesis, astonishingly, was also uh, an occurrence as well. What we did, however, was we also compared these experiences with experiences with non-psychedelic psychoactive drugs. So, common or garden, alcohol, uh, heroin, cocaine, or, or prescription drugs of some variety, tobacco, and so on. And su not surprisingly, perhaps, people don't report these kinds of experiences under the influence of non-psychedelic psychoactive drugs. So we have some, perhaps, good basis for expecting that people maybe have genuine psi experiences with the use of psychedelics in particular, not just any other drugs. Um, but we're not sure that these uh, experiences may be genuine unless we actually do some controlled experimental research. Uh, and of course, at that time, in the, in the kind of the, the peak of psychedelic uh, interest in the 1950s and 60s, there was actually some research conducted. Uh, classically, it was of the Xena card guessing type. Uh, you, you all know the Xena cards, I don't really need to explain those. Um, Sometimes they became a bit more high-tech and uh, automated over the years. So this one's probably from the 70s, judging by the hairdo and the ashtray in the lab. Um, but you get the basic idea. It's a forced choice design. People are, are forced to choose between these five basic symbols and typically because you are looking for small deviations from chance uh, over, over a long period of, of time. Over, over several runs, that people would have to do this card guessing task uh, iteratively over and over again, perhaps for several hours, to get the, a statistical significance. Uh, and so there was a number of these experiments conducted. 
uh, force choice design with a variety of different substances, uh, such as LSD, uh, some in the 60s, uh, including Walter Panke, the famous Good Friday experiment. Some of these were parapsychologists and some were primarily psychedelic researchers, but some also used ayahuasca in later years, some with uh, amanita and some with psilocybin. Now, of all those experiments, they all use these kind of card guessing kind of tasks. Uh, they typically had them guessing for several hours at a time. They also used naive participants as well. So these are people who have never taken a psychedelic before in their life, and they go into the laboratory, they're given LSD, and they're sat down and, and have to try and guess card symbols for the next three hours. Uh, and of course, a lot of the participants said, well, it was extremely boring. Uh, some of them said it was psychedelically immoral to make them do this on their first mystical experience, and so on and so forth. Um, so those experiments, uh, just to kind of praise and summarize them, were not very successful uh, in terms of their statistical significance. Uh, they were pretty much all a chance. Um, uh, however, we don't know if they would have been successful without drugs because in none of them did they use a control condition anyway. So there wasn't any no drug controls. So we can't really say much about them evidentially um, other than they didn't offer any good evidence for psi under those conditions with naive participants. Fortunately, there's been a somewhat improved design uh, over the years through uh, what's called free response whereby uh, people, uh, typically in an altered state, will just give a kind of a running commentary of their mental imagery, their mentation, uh, with a, a view to getting uh, an image of the intended target, whatever the target may be, such as an object in another room, one of a number of video clips, or uh, a painting, or some such. So there was a number of these uh, uh, free response type designs conducted over, over the years as well. Uh, initially by Smithers in 1950, using psychometry where they would hold an object, one by Osis using mediums. Um, in that one experiment, only one person did uh, particularly well. The other, the other five mediums were all incapacitated by the LSD, but one of them was able to very accurately describe the contents of a distant room, which was the target, which they hadn't seen. So one of them did very well, the other five did very badly. Um, some other experiments uh, with psilocybin, uh, some using clairvoyance with LSD and cannabis and uh, one using Gansfeld actually with Dick Beerman, um, which was, had its own problems but it uh, was at least fairly well controlled. Uh, one with uh, 62 people in an LSD experiment with Masters in Houston. Uh, and on the whole, these experiments were quite positive. Most of them reported some kind of positive results. However, it's very difficult to interpret evidentially what, what the value of those were because they rarely had any kind of statistical probabilistic interpretation because they were just based on the similarities of the verbal description based on the actual target without any decoys. Uh, and again, they never had any control conditions. They're also flawed somewhat uh, in most cases by the possibility of sensory leakage because certainly in the Masters in Houston experiment, they were doing telepathy experiments with, with the sender sat in front of them uh, uh, without any kind of shielding. So again, evidentially, uh, collectively, we can't really say very much about these experiments other than they were promising perhaps of the possibility of uh, producing psi with psychedelics. So that's where the current state of play is. Um, <clears throat> I should say, well, what are our actual reasonings for thinking that psychedelics might be psychinducive? And uh, I did a kind of literature review and pulled out a number of um, possible reasons from the various commentators on the subject over the years, including Adrian and various other people. Uh, and the primary one that people suggested is that psychedelics give us an increase in mental imagery, that it's much more vivid and has an increased quality of the imagery. And that's probably the primary reason why we might think that psychedelics are useful in uh, psi experiments, um, at least in conscious psi experiments where you're expected to kind of generate some kind of imagery of the target. 
Other reasons included, included altered perception of self-identity, such as experiences of unity consciousness, big C again, altered body perceptions, which might be useful uh, for inducing out-of-body experiences, distorted sensory input, increased absorption and focused attention. That isn't always the case with psychedelics, but uh, you certainly get an Atten absorption, but not always a focused attention. Increased empathy, certainly with substances like uh, MDMA. Actually, uh, when I first started doing this research, I'd asked for a grant from Rick Doblin from uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, who are interested in psychedelic research, not in parapsychology. And I said, you know, I want to do some research on this. And he said, well, that's great because I had a telepathic experience. If you can tell me what substance it was, I'll give you some money. And I guessed it was MDMA because it increases empathy. And he said, you're right. And so he gave me some money. Um, maybe I was being psychic, I don't know. Uh, emotional flexibility, which might, as Charles Tart said, be useful in negotiating the kind of fear of psi. Um, increased alertness and awareness, though not always. Um, increased inward uh, versus external focused attention and awareness, so you, you turn in towards your mental imagery rather than the external world. Um, increased spontaneity, uh, sensitivity to subtle changes, an increased intensity of feeling, uh, physical relaxation, not always, but possibly. Increased suggestibility, we do know that people become hyper-suggestible under the influence of psychedelics, and you know there's some notions that uh, hypnotic states might be psych-inducive. Increase in intuitive thought processes, of course. Uh, a reduced critical faculty, uh, and therefore the increased acceptance of impossible events, like psychic experiences. Uh, increased openness and extroversion. That was uh, Scott Rogo. I'll come back to that. A release of repressed and unconscious material into the conscious mind. Certainly that, that's the basis of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in that all your unconscious material becomes conscious. And then finally, complex distortions and the transcendence of space and time, which is certainly useful for precognition in terms of time. So there's some of the reasons people have suggested why psychedelics might be psych-inducive. We don't, the evidence doesn't really say either way. So I conducted my own research. I'm gonna tell you about four experiments that I've conducted. Uh, two of, only two since the last time I gave this talk to the SBR, but nevertheless. Um, uh, my first initial forays into this area were with uh, ayahuasca, which is a, a hallucinogenic brew used in the Amazon jungle by tribes such as the Shua from Ecuador and Peru. And ayahuasca is a mix of at least two plants, one of which is uh, chacruna, typically, uh, Cicotria viridis, which is uh, rich in uh, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is a naturally occurring psychedelic which we have in our own body. It's uh, found in various animals and plants. Uh, some people suggest it's found in all plants in, in trace quantities. Uh, a very widespread compound, but it's intensely psychedelic. However, uh, DMT is not orally active. You can eat, you can eat uh, chacruna all day long and you will not have a psychedelic experience because you have enzymes in your stomach which break down the DMT. So our Amazonians mix the, the DMT containing plants with the ayahuasca vine, uh, which contains alkaloids which prevent the enzymes in your stomach from breaking down the DMT. And they are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And when those alkaloids were originally isolated from ayahuasca uh, about 100 years ago, they were called, well, they were later identified as harmine and harmaline from the Paganum Hamala, but they were originally called telepathy by uh, a Colombian chemist called Cardenas Fisher. So this is the first, uh, one, probably the only uh, chemical I'm aware of which has a parapsychological name. Uh, so this seemed like a really good substance to do my research with. Now, the reason it was called telepathy was on account of the original explorers were typically, the typical kind of experiences were that people would be in the jungle drinking ayahuasca or observing the indigenous people drinking ayahuasca and some news would arrive through their experience that somebody was ill in the next village or somebody had died uh, and, and then the people were able to find out when they left the ceremony and maybe went back to civilization and got a telegram. So lots of people are having 
essentially clairvoyant experiences, and it became known as telepathy. So I conducted my first experiment with this. Um, I used a number of measures. I thought that the depth of the altered state of consciousness was important, uh, whether or not people, it would enhance people's ability to visualise, whether that was related to their ability to perform well in the precognition task. I used some other measures looking at their prior experiences and their beliefs. Uh, progress this time, well, at that point, I, I finally conducted, um, uh, I went into four uh, ayahuasca ceremonies uh, four, uh, six, four in Brazil and two in Ecuador and conducted my experiment and I also had a, a control group I did a number of pilot sessions before that and I ended up with 29 ayahuasca participants of which 20 were able to give me complete data um, perhaps for obvious reasons and I had a number of controls as well matched pairs so I had people who didn't take ayahuasca as a control group as well I also did a measure on my task before people drank ayahuasca and then once again under the influence of ayahuasca. And in the match pairs control, they just did uh, at one at the task, precognition task once, and then again at the same kind of time interval. Uh, so the results of that, you've probably seen before, I have presented this data more than once already. Uh, the match controls were relatively well matched on various indices, apart from age and their beliefs. Uh, and indeed people under the influence of ayahuasca had much greater changes in their states of consciousness. This was the basic task they had to do. Uh, it was a precognition task which I'd, I'd adapted from my PhD research, which I'll just tell you about very briefly. So originally this was a, uh, an unconscious side task where people would uh, told that they would have to do some kind of precognition task at some point but they just didn't know when and you'd show them this preparation task they would see four fractal images uh, that had been randomly generated and um, the people were just uh, told that they had to just pick the one they liked the most very quickly so they just very quickly identify which one they liked and then once they'd made their selection the computer would then choose one of the images or a number between one and four at random, uh, which corresponded to one of the images. And if they picked, the person picked the same one as the computer, that was considered a hit. Um, however, it was an unconscious task, so there needed to be some kind of reward for why the people would actually choose the same image as the computer. And they did this 10 times over, and if they scored above chance, i.e. above 2.5, 25% chance of getting one of those images, uh, they were rewarded if they scored below chance, like two or less hits, uh, they were punished. <laughs> well, we don't call it punishment. They were given a disincentive. And in this case, it was one of these awful cognitive psychology tasks where the number repeats itself over and over again and you've just got to keep an eye on it and report what, what the numbers do. It's called a vigilance task. And the worse they did on this task, the longer we went on the numbers. Uh, if they did well, uh, they were rewarded with some kind of um, enjoyable task. In some cases, we used uh, cartoons because they were m much easier to get through ethical clearance than my original idea, which was to use erotic images, uh, which did work very well. Um, and indeed, the better the people did on this precognition task, unconsciously, uh, the more erotic the images got. Uh, and that seemed to work quite nicely. Um, uh, so we did a number of these studies and overall we had a, a nice, very con successful hit rate. Uh, overall about 29% compared to 25% by chance. However, this was an unconscious side task. So people weren't consciously going, okay, I'm going to pick the target, I'm going to pick the clip or the, the, the image that the computer is going to select. It was very much a very quick unconscious task. But then I started to use it in an ayahuasca experiment where I was asking people to kind of consciously identify which clip was going to come next. So I made it a, a, an intentional task. Uh, the idea being that under the influence of the ayahuasca, people would be better able to visualize a fractal image. And, you know, they kind of were having more rich, colorful, geometric imagery. But um, there were problems with this particular task, as I'll explain. So the results of this first experiment um, 
were not particularly impressive, uh, uh, somewhat disappointing. Uh, so the blue line represents the ayahuasca group, the green line is the control group, the, the first point is their um, score before drinking ayahuasca in the experimental group, and the second score is their precognition under the influence of ayahuasca. And so you see this decrease in score under the influence of ayahuasca. Uh, so that would say, suggest that maybe people aren't precognitive um, under the influence of ayahuasca. However, we find in the control group, there was also this decrease in their scores as well, which tells you you have some kind of order effect, that people are doing worse the second time, regardless of whether they've drank ayahuasca or not. Um, so even ayahuasca doesn't make this task exciting the second time round. Um, so there were other problems with this. Um, there was no sight hitting overall, no apparent benefit of ayahuasca, a possible decline effect. There did seem to be some small relationship with the time from dosing. So the longer it was from dosing, people tended to score uh, worse. And in some cases, uh, it was several hours before people did the task and the ayahuasca had all but worn off. So the, the, they were scored better when they were at the peak of their ayahuasca experience. Uh, there was a, a hint of a relationship with the depth of their altered state of consciousness as well. Um, so people who did better when they were in a deeper state of consciousness. However, there were difficulties running the experiment of people. The people are there for an ayahuasca ceremony for their own spiritual growth or for healing. And I turn up with my laptop and ask them to take part in a kind of bizarre parapsychology experiment. And they have to kind of like leave the ceremony halfway through whilst extremely high and, and sit in my laptop and do this task. So, you know, there was some kind of mismatch between their objectives and mine and, in, and their abilities as well. So it wasn't ideal, demands of the setting. And there was problems with the task itself, but most importantly, it was a forced choice design. Um, the big problem being, as somebody pointed out, there's a lot of similarity between these, these target images. So if you're asking somebody intentionally to choose between four different images based on what they can visualize, it doesn't help that they're all very similar, like kind of garish colored fractal patterns with a Mandelbrot set in the middle. So that was kind of somewhat inhibitory of getting good results, it would seem. And it was also an intentional task. So I abandoned that particular line of research. And as I told you a few years ago, I, I started doing research with San Pedro cactus, which um, grows in the region as well, in the mountains of uh, the Andes. Uh, and uh, its, its chemical constituent is primarily mescaline. Um, <clears throat> Since the first kind of explorers encountered mescaline and San Pedro cactus, there's been reports of people having used it for psychic purposes, of course. And I managed to find a, uh, a curandero, a shaman, to let me, uh, well, he said initially I could do my experiment. And the idea was to replicate what I'd done with ayahuasca, get 20 participants, and they'd all do a trial each, um, and uh, we'd have a control group. But then when I pulled out my laptop, he basically said, oh, no. None of your electromagnetic juju in here. You're going to scare off all the spirits. So that kind of put an end to that experiment, or almost did. Uh, but I decided that there was a possible alternative. Instead of doing this experiment with 20 people, I could do the same task by having one person do all 20 trials. And I did, and that was, of course, me. Um, so I did a self-experiment. Um, 20 trials, N of 1. This time is a free, co free response uh, precognition design. Uh, basically four stages, a visualization. I would try and visualize the target under the influence of the mescaline. I would then view four one minute video clips. Um, and I wouldn't know what the target was, obviously. That wouldn't be very psychic. Um, I would then uh, look at all four video clips. Uh, I would vote on them. I'd give them a, a score between one and 100, depending on how closely they resembled my mental imagery with the intention of getting the target. So for instance, uh, it, my mental imagery might have been somewhat like the matrix, a little bit of some kind of cosmic planetary essence, uh, very unlike Rick and Morty, and maybe just a smidgen of Mary Poppins. And then you'd kind of get these different scores. So I'd rank them, and then we'd finally find out what the actual target was. 
by doing the verification and running a random number generator to produce the actual target. So it's a, a secure precognition design. I ran this 20 times over. I think most of you, probably, probably a few of you have probably seen this data before, but I'm going to go over it anyway. Um, that's getting high on San Pedro. This, uh, this, this, is, this is my first attempt. Uh, this was just to see uh, if I could function. I didn't actually use this data, although I got a very good hit. And, uh, and I merely, instead of like Gansfeld, where you get reams and reams of, of, of mentation, I just kind of wrote down a very small amount of detail, just, just one or two kind of concrete mental imagery that I could write down and see how that related to the clip. And this was the very first clip. This is what I saw. Ancient Greek scene, eyes, a city at night on a lake. And a little note to myself that it was very difficult to try and describe what I was seeing because it was very fluid. And this was the very first clip. Well, that woke you up. Well, you don't have to watch it all because it is very exciting. Uh, I was actually... Uh, gripping hold of the desk whilst watching this because it was very intense and then it finished after a minute and I was left wondering what I was doing and why the film had stopped and I looked down and I saw that I'd written ancient Greek scene. Um, so that was quite encouraging and I would have chosen that one as a target. I'll give you another example. This is, this is me cherry picking the best one now. Um, so this is all I wrote, the desert, dunes, the sands of time. And this was the clip out of the four that I chose. They and other snakes like the puff adder Not very impressive. On their ribs, lifting them up in groups and pulling the scales of the underside forward and over the rib tips. But then the clip changed. And I think you agree that's a good likeness to what I've written down. Desert dunes, the sands of time. To me, the most mystified. So that was, the, that was a particularly good one. Now, they weren't all as accurate as that, that would have been terrifyingly good. Um, they weren't always accurate at all. And often they would be quite thematic, so it wouldn't be the, that literal. So in this case, this one is very thematic uh, in that, as you'll see. So this is what I visualized and what I wrote down. Rotating, like helicopter blades, space, more mechanical stuff, spacecraft, space skeletons. And then a second part, water, a submarine, and a big rig, but underwater. And of the four clips, this is the one I chose. If I can find it. Oh no, it's disappeared. Here it is. I think I just blasted it. They're coming through! This might be familiar. Um, so you can see, I'll just turn that down a little. You can see how it, the similarities here. Uh, spacecraft, this is Star Wars. Uh, more mechanical stuff. I mean, it's the Death Star, you know, it's an entire planet made out of mechanical stuff. Space skeletons. Does it occur to me that stormtroopers are like space skeletons? You know, it's what George Lucas was trying to visualize. Okay, one of these kind of futuristic skeletons, yeah? And he came with stormtroopers. The helicopter blades uh, is a bit more puzzling, but you see Luke is fumbling around in his utility belt and he pulls out what is it actually a grappling hook, which he then eventually after the build of some suspense, throws around, you can see it's like these three helicopter blades which wrap around. He then kisses his sister, which I couldn't have ever foreseen, and then, you know, they escape, and the rest is history, as they say. So you can see all the elements of what I'd visualised was there. I didn't see that fantastic clip from Star Wars, but I did see thematically very, very similar things. And the second imagery was a bit more vague, but very thematic, you know, the sense of a mechanical thing floating but underwater this time. And if you don't believe me that stormtroopers look like space skeletons, here's some images which I nicked off the internet of Day of the Dead like stormtroopers. So I was quite pleased with that. Um, and overall, I got a significant result with just 20 trials using a summer runks analysis. Um, I did a control condition, which is somewhat meaningless because it's not a placebo or blind condition but I nevertheless get, had a go at doing it sometime later whilst not under the influence of mescaline and uh, pretty much scored at chance. So the results of that were at least encouraging that there's a proof of principle that this can work as an experimental protocol. Um, I didn't find any correlations with any of my other uh, 
uh, altered states measures, however. So I had some conclusions about that. That was uh, the, the, the psychedelics can be used as methodology amplifiers. They can help us identify what parts of a psi experiment uh, become problematic or, or useful uh, in these conditions, such as like these of boredom and so on. Uh, there was some difficulties maintaining my sanity, in fact, for eight hours, though. That was, uh, that was apparent because I started talking to myself. So I wouldn't advise working alone in this kind of research. Uh, six hours of continuous testing is too long, I discovered as well. I was very tired. Uh, and the process under the influence of mescaline, however, is much more engaging and fun. So that is one bonus. Uh, other issues about doing this first-person kind of research experimenter um, participant approach is that it can help with the transcendence of our ethnocentricism, so you know, it enables you to uh, adopt the kind of worldview of these indigenous shamans, perhaps, or pragmacentricism, that we should be in a sober state of mind to do science, help us transcend our fear of psi as well. It's ethically advantageous, you don't have to give anybody any drugs, uh, allows you greater insight into your research material and your own methodology. There's no problems either with concerns about the source of psi issue. So this is one of the big fundamental problems with uh, parapsychology research. If you run an experiment, you get significant results. Is it your subjects giving you the, the positive findings or is it the experimenter using their psi to kind of get the positive results? If you're the experimenter and the subject, that really doesn't matter. Uh, you presumably are the source of the psi. Uh, we also had less concerns concerning participant factors such as motivation, honesty and security because you know who the participant is and uh, the participant had better adherence to the protocol because they should know what they're doing. So there was various advantages to this. Um, I didn't get to replicate this for quite a long time. I was waiting for somebody else to do it. It never happened. Uh, then I was asked to uh, run a clinical drug trial in a, in a hospital in North London using LSD. We recruited um, uh, top level scientists from Cambridge and Oxford and Imperial College. Uh, the, the prerequisites were they had to be near completion of a PhD, or already have a PhD uh, in a science or technology based subject. Uh, and uh, a third of the participants had never taken any psychedelics before, and two, third, uh, two thirds had never taken any before, and one third had. And we, I did my precognition experiment in this clinical drug trial with the experienced uh, psychonauts. Uh, so we had 13 participants, um, prior use of, of psychedelics. Uh, we, uh, to get this through the ethics committee, I mean, we got LSD through the ethics committee very easily. In fact, they didn't have any concerns about doing this in a, in a hospital. Uh, but we thought it'd be a bit taboo if we had a parapsychology experiment in there. So we renamed it a, a visualization and projection task. Uh, and, but it was basically the same thing. And uh, so we had, they, they did it once uh, without LSD and then once on LSD. Uh, this was the basic setup. We'd have a kind of monetary room and there'd be three little uh, private wards where people would sit in there, take the LSD under supervision with the sitter. Um, so we did people in groups of three, typically. This is the actual outcome of the study. So this is the pre-LSD scores were um, pretty much at chance. However, uh, those under the influence of LSD had significant uh, score. Uh, with only one go of this task, one trial, uh, under the influence of LSD and just 13 participants. The rather annoying thing is <laughs> that it was significant in the opposite direction. So this was a psi missing effect, uh, which is rather unexpected um, and somewhat annoying. Actually, yeah. So you can see here from the spread of scores, uh, where's my pointer? That's not my pointer, here's my pointer. Um, here, so this is the spread of scores. These are the, the target ranks. So if they ranked uh, it first, that was a direct hit. And you can see that on the whole, people tended to, to rank the actual target fourth, the lowest ranking. So there's, oh, it's least like my mental imagery. And, and so we actually got significant sign missing. So why is that? 
Um, one of the problems is its potential uh, order effects because the, the LSD condition was always second. They did the, the pre-LSD and then LSD, so it's always in that order. So it could be an order effect, not an LSD effect. Um, however, so we looked at uh, possible personality variables as predictors, and we actually found that there were some very good predictors of score. So we found, for instance, that neuroticism uh, very strongly correlated with their precognition score under the influence of LSD. Uh, so those who are higher in neuroticism scored worse. The, those higher in extroversion and openness to experience scored much better. And of course we found a relationship between visualisation and dose. However, that was also in the negative direction. Just to point this out, there's a recent uh, meta-analysis in the Journal of Parapsychology where they looked at various personality factors as predictors of precognition, uh, precognition performance and a forced choice task, and they found that openness to experience and extroversion were actually predictors of uh, performance and precognition tasks. So one explanation for why our, my scientists uh, got sign missing is because they were largely uh, not open to experience, somewhat introverted and quite neurotic, uh, which says a lot about scientists perhaps uh, as test subjects for uh, LSD precognition experiments. Only time will tell. Um, one thing that was also peculiar was there was a, 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 an inverse relationship between dose and their ability to visualize the target. Now you thought, the more LSD they'd had, they'd be better able to visualize the target. It turns out that wasn't the case. Uh, so those on 100 micrograms uh, did worse, so they would find, find it very difficult to visualize, uh, which was surprising. And then I put that down to the fact that they were probably so high, they couldn't actually get anything concrete long enough to verbalize it, um, which is one possibility. So that's where it ended until quite recently, uh, and I was able to uh, start a new project. Um, uh, this time a field research, I mean, it's not every day that you're able to run a clinical drug trial with psychedelics and do a parapsychology experiment. So uh, I tried to devise my own research. You don't get funding for that kind of research. The, the clinical drug trial cost about a million pounds. So uh, it's not, I'm not likely to get that kind of money or Adrian, probably, for doing this kind of research. So I've started doing uh, field research with people on psychedelics, in this case DMT, which is an intense, uh, very strong psychedelic substance. Uh, and I managed to get it through my ethics at the university. And if, if it's field research, so the idea is that people bring their own DMT and I do the experiments with them in their own home. We keep them anonymous and so on. Uh, the university ethics department, uh, finally were reassured that this was okay to do and um, we have actually quite literally been in fields at certain points doing this research. Uh, people like to do it outside. Uh, so, so far, I'm going to give you the preliminary findings of that. I've been doing running my precognition experiment. I'm planning to run 20 participants, uh, but I thought I'd just give you the data I have so far. We started doing this in the end of July. 10 participants so far very strong doses, a breakthrough dose of DMT. To give you a sense of it, DMT, if you smoke it, lasts about 10 minutes, but it can be a completely life-changing experience. It's very, very intense. So we asked our participants to give us an intensity rating of their experience every minute during their DMT experience. So one minute after they'd smoked it, it starts immediately. One minute after they smoked it, we'd say, okay, Terence, uh, how intense is your experience on a scale of one to 10? And we pre-warned them about this. And typically people, and we said, we said, oh, so give you an anchor, you know, one is a normal state of consciousness and 10 is you're so dissociated and high, you can't understand the question and you don't know who I am or who you are. So you can't say it. So if it's, if it's a 10, you can't say it's a 10, okay? The most you can verbalize is a nine. And so we get to the first minute and we say to them, okay, Terence, on a scale of one to 10, how intense is this experience? And they'd either go 10 or they just wouldn't say anything at all. Um, and so it's very intense. Uh, and typically we'd wait till they get to a three 
so they could still they could actually begin to function and had some autonomy again and we'd get them to try and visualize the target so the visualization was either done under dmt or not under the influence of dmt uh, some they did before some did after uh, but the same process again except for they do the viewing and the voting and the visualization once they'd actually come back to terra firma normal reality i uh, just give you one of the example of one of the uh, kind of uh, participants' uh, outputs. I'm surrounded by floating seaweed-like creatures trying to show me what they carry inside. They were like nutrients carried inside a root or like green blood for that creature. Looks similar with human tissue under a microscope. This was one of the video clips. Um, he actually said it was the, the bit at the end was the most comparable. So this is um, an animation of uh, DNA. So you get the sense that they're looking at human tissue under a microscope. And he actually said, uh, whoops, the human tissue that I saw in the trip was very similar with the last part of the clip where the circular cells were moving and creating other tissue and also creating beams of light. And in this case, the computer happened to agree as well. So that was a, a hit. Um, so, so far we've only had 10 participants, it's not the full sample, um, and uh, these are their scores in red on DMT. This is, this is a kind of, uh, a, kind of like a Z score basically of their ratings relative to all their ratings of the non-target clips. Uh, so anything positive is above chance, anything negative is below chance. So on DMT they've been scoring above chance. Not on DMT, they've been scoring below chance, which is, is quite encouraging, although not yet significant. Only 10 participants um, on one trial in each condition. So that was very encouraging. Uh, just to kind of continue on with the previous work, we also looked at order effects. So I had people uh, doing, half of them would do a, a, a non-DMT task before and one half after DMT. And we have very pronounced order effects as well, which is quite curious. And I'm not entirely sure why that is. So the second time round, first time round, people tend to score above chance. The second time, they score below chance. However, that's independent of their use of DMT, because when you break it down between the different conditions, you see they still score the first time on DMT much higher, uh, but if they, the second time they score lower in both conditions, uh, and it's more pronounced when they're not on DMT. So there's both a, a, an order effect and a DMT effect, which are independent of each other. Um, somehow related to their confidence, they're also more confident in the first trial. So there's something about doing this task, people's confidence, is in, their confidence in rating the clips reduces. So people maybe get worried, maybe don't feel that they, they should get it right or something's going on. So there is some genuine order effects going on. Um, and uh, both the drug and the order affected their ability to visualize, to, to see the mental imagery. In this case, DMT enhanced their ability to visualize, but if they did the task the second time, their, their ability to visualize reduced. So what to make of that? Probable effect of DMT on precognition ability, can't say for certain. Uh, order effects seem slightly more pronounced than the drug effects. DMT enhances visualization ability. That's not big news. Uh, order effects also affect visualization ability. The effects on the confidence ratings are primarily due to order and no apparent effects of dosage. However, people always, the dose doesn't matter because people are doing it based on how intense the experience is. When they get to a three, they actually do the experiment. So my interpretation is the expected DMT effects are emerging but possible order effects may be due to psychological factors like demotivation or the fear of psi. So that's the, the, the research so far. Um, I wouldn't say we've got any conclusive evidence for precognition, but the research is ongoing. Um, just a few things to say about this. Generally, these experiences are relatively common. They're not necessarily delusional. They may be useful for personal transformation. Um, so they shouldn't be pathologized necessarily. Uh, Psychedelic-induced experience can inform on our understanding of the neurobiology of exceptional experiences like psi, because we know, well, you understand a little bit about the action of these drugs in the brain. Uh, the research can help us understand the full spectrum of human psychology, of course, 
and they may give us insights even into the ontology as well, basically the, the nature of the shamanic worldview, the reality of the shamanic worldview. When shamans say they transcend time and space and bring back useful information, are they genuinely doing that? And of course they can give us a repeatable means for exploring consciousness and the mind-body problem and so on. Thank you very much for listening. That's it.